previous class we uh, looked at the reason why one of their major components the fiber is used what is its uh, functionality and uh, what are the options that we have typically in an aerospace structure for the fiber so we'll go into the other major component of the composite namely the matrix today so we'll go on the same lines uh, by asking a question which is uh, why the matrix in the first place uh, many a times um, uh, the word resin is used uh, almost interchangeably with the uh, matrix, uh, but uh, since we are typically talking about generally all kinds of composites, including uh, metal matrix or ceramic matrix, the more appropriate term would be to uh, call it a matrix, and in plural it is matrices. So uh, it's quite obvious once we looked at the fiber, uh, and also uh, in terms of composites, the disadvantages we were saying, why in spite of, etc. So there, the uh, primary uh, issues with the fiber alone were encountered. So I, that is what the other member of this uh, material, the composite, uh, tends to overcome. So the primary handicap with using just the fibers is uh, its almost negligible compressive strength in the longitudinal direction. Um, it should be very, very important that you qualify it by saying it is the compressive strength and stiffness in the longitudinal direction which is low because um, perpendicular to the fiber, it is fairly good at uh, handling the compressive loads both in terms of the stiffness as well as the uh, strength. So it's only along the length that it is having an issue. And that issue we want to overcome with the help of the matrix. Now, th uh, there are certain fallouts of this fact that it is uh, low in compressive, compressive uh, load carrying capability is that bending load carrying capability is also low because bending requires both tension and uh, compressive uh, capabilities and this has only tensile capabilities not the comp uh, compressive capability and which is what another thing that we want to look up, look up from the matrix. Uh, the final thing is the fact that uh, if you have a bunch of fibers and you try to apply a shear load, once again, that is not going to be able to hold that. So in other words, transfer shear capability is also very low for the fiber alone. So these are the three major issues using fiber alone. There are a few others as well, the major issues, which can be easily overcome by uh, placing these fibers in an appropriate way within the matrix, which is what we will see as one of the main reasons why we use the matrix, but there are many other functionalities that the matrix brings in as well. Uh, so as I said, uh, the first aspect is to overcome all the uh, issues, disadvantages or cons of using only the fibers. Uh, it cannot support, uh, the fibers alone cannot support longitudinal compressive load and therefore bending as well. And uh, the fact that it has poor transverse properties. Um, if not only you're talking about the, uh, the uh, fact that, the, I, I said that it has a good compressive strength, but a bunch of fibers doesn't have a good tensile strength also in the transverse direction because their fibers can just go apart from each other. Though with a single fiber itself, uh, if at all there is a way of testing its tensile strength in the transverse direction, it may be reasonably okay, but there's no way of utilizing it in that uh, form factor. So, uh, so that's the, the uh, because when we say transverse properties, it includes not only transverse shear, but also the transverse normal, both tensile and compressive, which is why uh, we need to specifically mention that. Next aspect is that it holds together the bunch of fibers because the fibers are not acting um, uh, as an individual, but they are a bunch of fibers and all these fibers need to transfer the loads between each other. And uh, uh, first of all, they have to be held together and which is what the uh, matrix does. Uh, uh, instead of them being separate set of uh, structural units, uh, individuals, you are bringing them into a team which is a structural unit that you have. And uh, is a classic example of uh, your kindergarten story where you talk about a farmer giving a bunch of sticks to uh, his three sons and asking them to break it. And uh, the uh, uh, ones who tie, uh, try to break it with the entire thing tied up uh, fail, whereas the ones who can take off stick by stick and break each one of them separately is the one uh, who is able to do it. So same thing in the case of the fiber as well. Uh, individually, they're not able to perform much. They don't have much strength or stiffness, but as a bunch, they can. 
but the thing that ties them up, like the thread in the case of the sticks, is the matrix over here. So that's the huge important role that it plays in bringing together these individuals into a team, which is what makes into it into a structural unit. And uh, to distribute and transfer the stresses is the most important structural function because um, there is a fact possibility that individual fibers might break. So even in tensile load, it is possible that uh, in the longitudinal direction, the fibers by themselves can sometimes have undergo failure. But the fact that they are within a matrix means that through the shear in the matrix, the tensile loads in the fibers can be transferred from one fiber to the uh, adjacent set of fibers, which makes, uh, once again, uh, their team uh, work possible. And then it is to protect the fibers from external damage and environment. So it acts like a sleeve within which these fibers are. So the kind of uh, temperatures, the kind of uh, corrosive environments, et cetera, that the uh, environment might involve, all of that um, is not something that the fibers are directly exposed to now because uh, the way they are, they're quite flimsy and um, uh, uh, and uh, even with the kinds of coatings and other things that they have, uh, long time exposure of the fibers by themselves to harsh uh, thermal and uh, corrosive environments can be quite destructive for them. But the fact that the matrix can handle many of these in a much better fashion uh, helps in protecting them. Uh, unless otherwise stated, we are talking of uh, you know, polymer matrix over here, which means that the polymer matrices, the uh, chemical reactivity is much lower than, for example, carbon itself or uh, many of the you know, metallic fibers that, ca that can be there. So all of them uh, can tend to be protected by that. And uh, of course, many of these fibers like carbon, etc., have fairly high temperature capabilities also themselves, just that uh, you want to avoid their thermal uh, expansion and things like that, because that is also quite high for them. The matrix tries to insulate that as well. The next thing is uh, in terms of providing a certain level of ductility, which means that the fiber themselves, even though the strengths, tensile strengths in the longitudinal direction might be very large, it fails at a fairly low strain, which means that its ductility is low. The percentage elongation phase is fairly small. But now, in the presence of the matrix, the matrix offers a certain level of expansion over and above what the fibers offer, and therefore, a slight increase in ductility is seen uh, in the case of polymer matrix composites. In the case of metal matrix composites, obviously, the uh, ductility is much, much more. And therefore, once the uh, failure strain is quite large, the uh, area under the stress strain curve becomes naturally larger, and therefore, the fracture toughness becomes uh, greater as well in the case of metal matrix composites, primarily because of the matrix over there. Uh, then uh, in terms of the electrical insulation, etc., again, uh, there's that tailorability that we have uh, in terms of the appropriate choice of the uh, matrix and the volume fractions, uh, which are primarily dictated by the structural functions. But when there is a certain range that you have uh, possible with the structural uh, design, uh, you could probably use that to tailor the uh, electrical functionalities as well, including insulation, uh, just like the thermal insulation as well. Then, uh, yeah. About, uh, yeah. The scalability of any matrix uh -huh. effect uh, provide an undue uh, extension of uh, fibers? Yeah, uh, it's a good question. But uh, what typically happens is, um, though from the micromechanics point of view, when we will see uh, doing the uh, micromechanics to get the equivalent uh, homogenized composite properties, we will take all the uh, fibers and the matrix extending equally. In reality, what happens is that there can be a differential change over a long length of the specimen of the fiber and the matrix. So uh, the fact that the uh, matrix is ductile and is able to extend much more uh, does not necessarily mean that the fibers also have to extend by the same amount. There will be a stress which is developed at the interface, which is uh, if the interface is designed properly as well in terms of the appropriate coatings and the way it is bonded, uh, it will be able to withstand that while the matrix is extending a, a larger amount compared to the individual fibers. And also, um, 
a large specimen or even a structural component, uh, uh, you may not always have the fiber ex extending from end to end. It will typically be a set of fibers, even in continuous fibers that we are talking about, typically what we call within quotes as continuous fibers, may not actually run, run through the entire length of the structure sometimes. Um, it might be of the order of magnitude of the length of the structure, but there will be uh, stress transfer between uh, one fiber to other, which is happening through the matrix, and therefore the ductility of the matrix plays a huge role over there. It's a good question, though. Yeah. Uh, now, uh, we saw in terms of the fibers, there are so many different choices for the fiber, what all uh, you can use, and depending upon whether it's a strength-based design, stiffness-based design, uh, and the various other technical aspects apart from non-technical aspects we discussed. Similarly, you want to look at some of the primary governing factors in terms of your choice of the matrix. One obvious choice is, of course, you have already chosen the fiber. You want a matrix which is compatible with it. So that compatibility is an important point. Um, but also, in terms of the range or uh, the shortlisted set of matrices from which you want to look at, you know, typically it's based on the uh, service temperature of the component that you're going to be designing with that particular composite. So you have a, a particular component in mind. You know the kind of loading that it can typically go through in service. And by loading, we mean not just the uh, mechanical loads that it undergoes, but also the thermal loads, which means that range of temperatures that it's going to be experiencing, what we call as the service temperature. And um, depending on that service temperature range also, you tend to shortlist your matrices. Because um, apart from the fact that you can have uh, carbon matrices, uh, ceramic matrix, metal matrix, and polymer matrix. Within polymer matrices itself, there are so many other choices that you can have. Um, you typically can have elastomers, as we talked about in the example of the uh, tires, for example, in a previous class. Uh, you, on the other hand, you could have plastics, which could be either thermoset plastics or thermoplastic plastics. We'll look at some of their distinctions uh, a, a little later, probably in this slide or next. But um, the, in terms of that, the, there's, uh, within each one of them, the thermosets, there are quite a few examples. Again, thermoplastics, quite a few examples, which specifically you go through. Um, that kind of gets narrowed down once these two things come into picture. The compatibility with the fiber that you've already chosen, one. And the other is the range of temperatures that the structure is going to experience uh, through its uh, life cycle uh, dominantly. So uh, the first set that we typically look through is the thermoset uh, polymers or plastics. And uh, these typically can go up to 150 degrees centigrade. We're talking of uh, a, uh, a very broad class of materials. So there can be quite a few exceptions. There can be a few which are beyond 150 degrees centigrade, which are also thermosets. But we are talking of the majority of these uh, types of materials. And from the very uh, name, you can see, uh, you could probably also remember from your high school physics in terms of this classification of uh, uh, plastics as thermoset and thermoplastic. The fact that it is set means that it is in such a uh, state that you start with uh, a liquid kind of a form, and then you have a physical process through which it gets set. And once it is solidified, it's very difficult to uh, liquefy it once again. So essentially, uh, it's something that uh, uh, once uh, it is in the structural component, nothing more can be done about it. In that sense, the recyclability is a major issue for these, uh, these kinds of uh, matrices, the thermoset. Uh, but uh, the processing is much, much easier over here because they are available in the wet form, which is what makes the prepregs that we discussed earlier in terms of the impregnation. That, make, uh, that is uh, possible primarily because of this particular nature, that they are in a liquid form and they get into a solid form upon certain temperature and th uh, pressure cycles, which are fairly simple. Uh, though for larger and larger components, the autoclaves, et cetera, that you want to use are uh, more difficult. But nonetheless, uh, this has been uh, one of the primary ways in which um, aerospace composites have approached this um, utilities of composites uh, in uh, many structural components, be it airplanes or uh, launch vehicles, et cetera, using epoxy matrices with carbon fibers, glass fibers, or Kevlar fibers in particular. Uh, there are some examples where polyester is also used. That's also another example of the thermoset. Uh, though we are listing these as if they are single materials, within epoxy itself, there are many grades of aerospace 
level, uh, certified epoxies and uh, there are slight differences between their properties uh, and uh, also in terms of their curing, uh, the curing process which is uh, involved with them and therefore uh, the kind of uh, uh, manufacturing that you have to subject it to in an autoclave. Now if you have applications which are slightly higher in temperature, uh, all the way up to let's say 425 degrees centigrade, uh, again individual uh, materials will uh, quite uh, differ quite a bit, but we are just giving some um, range ranges over here, don't take these numbers uh, very strictly uh, because there can be quite a uh, bit of a play over here. Already I said there, are, there could be a few thermosets which go beyond 150 degrees centigrade also. Uh, we, this is a very, very broad classification that we are trying to get. Um, and what we are talking of is the service temperature, the actual manufacturing temperatures which will be involved could also be quite different from this uh, because in thermoplastics in particular you are going through a, a chemical process in which this is getting, uh, unlike here it was a physical process, a chemical process is involved with the thermoplastics and these polymers, uh, some examples which are typically used in aerospace especially is peak. Uh, nylon is used uh, uh, quite a bit in the automobile industry and a few other industries as well. So this is polyether, ether ketone, uh, the short form for that is peak and uh, so uh, there has been a lot of uh, move uh, across the aerospace industry to especially because of the complaints about the non-recyclability and therefore environmentally unfriendly nature of the thermosets to move towards the thermoplastics. Uh, Huge setups have been made by the aerospace industry because this has been used for quite a few decades now so, and also the processes were relatively simple whereas once you come to the thermoplastics it is a little more uh, complex process that is involved in the fabrication and therefore uh, initially there was quite a bit of a resistance but slowly people are seeing sense in terms of uh, long term implications of uh, not only in terms of the life cycle, life cycle of the product but also beyond wh that what happens and therefore uh, you see quite a bit of a transition taking place uh, to the thermoplastics. Um, it is not that necessarily thermoplastics are more expensive than thermosets, there are quite a few thermoplastics which are uh, quite low cost also but the kind of aerospace grade that you might have and also the kind of processing that is necessary because placing the fiber in the thermoplastic is quite di difficult because it goes through a certain glass transition and then it becomes a liquefied form but that liquid is highly viscous compared to what you have over here and therefore you can imagine if you have a less viscous fluid placing the fibers in, in it is much easier whereas if you have a very viscous fluid uh, 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 placing the fibers uh, where you want in terms of their geometrical spread, the orientation, etc., becomes a little more challenging. It's not impossible, but uh, involves a little more uh, expensive and uh, time-consuming processes. Uh, all of which are again uh, things which are being revolutionized, and therefore uh, we are doing much better with thermoplastic manufacturing today than we were even five, five, ten years back. So then um, it is only when uh, the temperatures uh, are beyond this, which is very rare in most aerospace structural applications like a, let us say a wing or a fuselage or a horizontal tail or a vertical tail, uh, many of these examples you will see that um, uh, this is good enough. In fact, uh, thermosets itself was pretty good enough, it is only um, uh, from recyclability point of view that we moved on to thermoplastics. But in terms of the temperature capabilities, um, only when you are looking at components, let us say closer to the engine or within the engine uh, and a few other uh, very uh, 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 thermally loaded structures uh, where the temperatures may not actually go up to this, but the thermal fatigue that is involved might be there. So even if let us say up to let us say 400 degrees centigrade plus or minus is involved in terms of a fatigue uh, uh, and then uh, you would not want to go close uh, to that using a thermoplastic, you would rather go for a metal even though its capability is much higher from a thermal uh, fatigue point of view this might be good and in most cases it is a combination of thermal and mechanical or what we call as thermomechanical fatigue that many of these structural components are subjected to and which case um, this makes more sense over there. But the problem getting into metal matrix composites is uh, one of the advantages that we had with plastics was their low density. Now we are going to metals which are obviously uh, denser, uh, in other words the weight penalties which are involved are larger. 
but he, when we are looking at it, this as a metal matrix composite as a replacement for a, um, let's say, a metal itself, pure uh, metal or a metallic alloy rather, then uh, obviously you're having much uh, larger specific strengths and stiffnesses still. And therefore, that's where you look at it. You're not looking at it as a replacement for a fiber matrix composite uh, being replaced by a metal matrix composite. Obviously, we said that the service temperature is what dictates that. and. Uh, therefore uh, and also the compatibility with the fiber and therefore we go for metal matrix composites over there now uh, within the engine itself uh, again depending on the type of the engine you have many uh, uh, different uh, configurations but essentially you can think of the um, combustion chamber and beyond as much higher temperatures the prior to the combustion chamber uh, large temperatures but not so large so metal matrix composites might be good enough for uh, let's say the compressor or the fan and a uh, few other uh, such structures but once you get into the um, let's say the uh, the combustion chamber itself etc there are of course again uh, certain metals like single crystal metals like nickel etc which are uh, very good but they are typically not used in a matrix form with a composite so mostly the matrices uh, which are metal matrices which are used are like uh, uh, because matrix remember you need to have some level of softness to be able to place the fiber in it so typically you have softer uh, me uh, metals like aluminium or titanium etc which could be used as uh, the matrix uh, but not very uh, hard metals that uh, will not allow too much of movement even in their um, uh, semi-solid kind of a form where you want to uh, make the placement of the fibers. So once you get into the combustion chamber and or the turbine and the nozzle, uh, etc., then you have to go for ceramic matrix uh, 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 as the choice instead of metal matrix, which can take you to a even higher temperatures of about 1650 degrees centigrade. Uh, one example which is used in a few aerospace uh, components is borosilicate glass as the, uh, as the matrix in which certain fibers are placed. Um, again, uh, ceramic matrix, uh, there are again many different classes. Uh, once again, uh, the kind of process that is involved becomes very different over here because uh, you, uh, you cannot kind of melt it like what you do with a metal or use the uh, physical process or physical processes that you use with this thermoset or thermoplastic. Instead, uh, they are, they are uh, heated to a certain extent that they become vapors. And then you have either a PVD or a CVD, which is a physical vapor deposition or a chemical vapor deposition that you undertake. In order to deposit this, you already have a network of fibers. It could be either a fabric or a set of fabrics, or it could be UD fibers also, which are in a chamber. And into that chamber, you are uh, pumping in this uh, vapors of the ceramic, which eventually settle down all around uh, this. Uh, through those uh, physical vapor, physical or chemical vapor deposition processes uh, that might be involved. The physical doesn't involve any chemical reactions, whereas the, um, uh, there could be a certain chemical set of reactions that are involved with the CVD process. Then uh, even higher temperatures, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, again, that is a challenge, but there are techniques by which this has improved in, ter in terms of how you place those pores through which the vapor comes and you uh, have a certain placement. Uh, uh, you take into, uh, 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 into account the gravity that is involved and um, all around you typically the, the way these PVD or CVD uh, chambers and their uh, nozzles, etc., are designed. Uh, that takes care to, to the extent possible with the current state of the art. You want a uniform deposition that uh, that occurs. Exactly. Yeah. 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 So a CVD might also involve multiple different entities which are coming through different uh, nozzles, which eventually react and then deposit over that. In a PVD, it's usually a single kind of uh, vapor that is coming through all the nozzles, which gets deposited on. Uh, yeah, uh, very good question. So uh, typically the range at which these temperatures that they can take is very large. So uh, the thermal fatigues are typically uh, not those which will go up to uh, those kinds of extremes. So you might have uh, thermal fatigues in the range of, let's say, about room temperature to about uh, 400, 500 degrees centigrade, depending upon the actual where that structural component comes. 
So within that range, uh, the, uh, if you draw typically the, uh, the drop in the strength uh, versus uh, the temperature that you're having or the temperature, similar to your SN kind of a, a, a plot, instead of N being the number of mechanical cycles, you have it as a, a thermomechanical cycles and or purely thermal cycles, then you would see that the drops is, are not as steep with these uh, ceramics compared to uh, many of the other materials that uh, are of uh, consideration. Uh, it's not only the maximum uh, temperatures uh, we are talking about, which is primarily a static kind of a thing. One time it can take up to that, but uh, what is more important is that uh, thermomechanical fatigue, which will in all these cases be much lesser than the numbers which are given over here. But still, uh, it's something that uh, we can live with as we go further down. It's not only uh, capable of handling uh, uh, so maximum temperatures, but also ma uh, more and more uh, thermo, uh, uh, thermal fatigue uh, as well. Yeah. But ceramics are, uh, the issue is, of course, the impact susceptibility. Even when it is, in the, uh, uh, it is used as a matrix with a composite, that uh, issue is still there. So you have to make sure that you're using it in components where uh, direct impact might not be occurring. It might be within some other structure which uh, phases the impact and then this is the uh, next level of structure where you might still have uh, reasonable um, uh, utility over there without affecting the overall failure of the system. Yeah. Anybody else have a question? Yeah, so yeah sorry. That, uh, with the increase in temperature, only brittleness of the Uh, it, uh, it could, uh, but see, essentially what you're talking about in terms of brittleness is the uh, percentage of elongation at which it, uh, it fails, right? So the lower it is, the more um, brittle it is. But uh, as you go to higher temperatures, um, if unless the ceramic is undergoing certain major changes in its uh, microstructure, that is not going to be affected too much. So uh, for most ceramics, that's not a uh, major issue to be uh, worried about. Uh, in any case, there, um, uh, the failure strains are pretty low. Uh, so uh, the amount of change is also a very, very small fraction of that. Okay, so carbon matrix, as I said, uh, can go to even higher temperatures uh, for re-entry vehicles and other things that could be um, an option that is uh, being considered. So with this, uh, uh, we conclude a very, very brief um, uh, study of the matrix. Uh, it's more of a material science and also a lot of chemistry, especially when you're talking of the polymer matrices. There's a lot of chemistry that is involved. So the uh, people with a chemical science background do a lot of work related to the matrices over there. Mm, uh, we take advantage of their end products. We typically have a, a selection to make based on the properties, and then we go ahead. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, definitely, yeah, yeah. So it depends on the specific uh, material that is involved, what kind of ions it can, and uh, wh uh, whether th those are reactive or not, those ions with the uh, surfaces of the um, chamber and uh, or the uh, fibers that are involved. So based on the appropriate choice, uh, it's a good point that you brought out. So uh, 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 traditionally, it's been PVD and CVD which have been used more, but where we have a case for uh, IVD, that's definitely uh, something that can be considered as well. Yes. Okay. So the next question, uh, remember when we started off with composites, we were asking many different questions, why, um, what, how, et cetera. And so we have not yet gone to how. That would be one of the major things we'll be looking at. But before that, we'll look at some examples of where. Uh, this is something that um, through the assignments, especially the first and the third, I already tried to uh, make you aware of through your own literature survey, where all it goes into and for what, what reasons, etc. So to a large extent, you are already familiar with. I'll just try to give a few uh, more examples uh, to make that a little more clearer. Okay, so uh, where it is used again in terms of the flight vehicles, be it from aircraft, uh, where you typically use pre-preg kind of autoclave kind of a manufacturing. Um, you could have uh, filament wound uh, structures uh, for, uh, let's say, missiles and or uh, launch vehicles, uh, essentially pressure chambers that you're looking at. And then um, you could have uh, many other uh, semi-monocoque constructions, depending upon uh, how those uh, individual items are made, 
there is also a lot of move towards integrally manufacturing all of them, uh, co-curing uh, the entire, entire semi-monocoque construction. It's only from a modeling perspective, you look at it as separate entities, but actually they might be manufactured simultaneously, uh, the uh, stringers and the uh, skin, for example, uh, the spar, etc. they could all be uh, manufactured uh, simultaneously. But once you go for larger and larger structures, the challenges of having larger and larger autoclaves makes it uh, necessary to make them in parts and then uh, bring them and join them together in certain uh, ways. And uh, again, uh, certain designs, as we saw already, uh, could involve uh, more emphasis on the stiffness uh, compared to the strength. Uh, not when I, when I say emphasis, uh, it means that we're not letting off the other thing, but using the secondary uh, aspects as constraints and uh, using the topmost aspect as your, the one that you want to optimize or maximize in terms of the capabilities that is involved. <coughs> Yeah, so we have rockets, we have missiles, we have satellites, all these examples where uh, they are used. Uh, again, um, here helicopters as well as airplanes. Um, within airplanes, the fighters to a large extent have been uh, the most demanding in terms of the performance and therefore uh, some of the initial large usages of composites have been uh, in fighter aircraft. Uh, uh, similarly, compared to fixed wing, the rotary wing, uh, the kind of challenges are much, much more and therefore um, uh, in terms of pioneering composites, helicopters have played a huge role, uh, especially once we started giving up those hinges and bearings that I talked to you about in a previous class, because almost all the helicopters that are made today, uh, more, more of the cutting edge helicopters are all bearingless and hingeless uh, kind of rotor configurations, both for the main rotor as well as the tail rotor, in which case uh, the uh, advantages of composites over there is much, much more uh, because of the flexibility that can be tailored uh, through the flight drops and the matrix rich regions uh, that you can have close to the uh, pseudo hinge or pseudo bearing that you want to have and therefore uh, it becomes um, uh, uh, it, it's quite self-explanatory as to why helicopters have been uh, much more pioneering in the usage of composites compared to uh, fixed wing aircraft. Again, uh, in terms of the uh, space applications also, it's typically like re-entry vehicles, etc., where you have much more uh, stringent uh, demands in terms of the performance. There, once again, there has been a lot more emphasis on high temperature composites uh, for the external structures and for the interior structures, uh, the more conventional composites. Um, again, uh, that uh, in, as in many other technologies from the aerospace industry has uh, percolated to more um, mass consumer usage like in the automobile industry, um, again uh, for wind turbine applications, many other um, uh, e energy applications which are um, uh, uh, using these materials to, in order to further increase the efficiency because uh, to start with the efficiencies were pretty low. E even now, for example, if you take uh, photovoltaic cells for solar cell applications, you have uh, the efficiencies of the order of, uh, let's say, 10-15% or so at the most. Uh, there are lab level uh, ones which go for much higher, but the costs involved uh, for large scale manufacturing is very high. Similarly, in terms of uh, the uh, uh, amount of energy that you can extract from the wind, depending upon the region where these wind turbines are installed, uh, it could be seasonal and certain, uh, you want to maximize the effect uh, in certain uh, seasons compared to the others and uh, you want to store it. So the battery technologies, etc. so many other uh, things become important. So wherever it is possible to increase the efficiency, you want to do that and light weighting is one way for the turbine blades where uh, you can in enhance the overall efficiency in terms of how much of the wind energy you are able to capture and therefore uh, wind turbine blades for a long, long period of time have been uh, made out of composite uh, materials. Um, there are lots of offshore structures which are uh, designed with uh, composites. Uh, once again, uh, these could be in terms of turbines uh, which are using the uh, uh, waves or also in terms of oil extraction. Uh, where you want to tra uh, transfer the oil from the uh, place where it is extracted, which could be somewhere in the middle of the ocean or the sea, and then you want to transfer it to the land. So there are long pipelines which run through. And uh, many of these pipelines earlier used to be uh, made using metals. 
and uh, there the change in temperature over the seasons was causing a lot of thermal stresses and uh, uh, some were leading to leakages and then the oil leaks into the ocean uh, it affects the marine life apart from the loss in the oil itself. So there, there, uh, there have been lots of joints which have been made uh, between these long pipes you cannot have beyond a certain length then you want to join one pipe to the other. So these joints allow for certain expansion or contraction uh, across them. And uh, to start with, many of these joints were made out of composites, and now quite a few of these piping structures themselves are also uh, made out of uh, composites. And this is not something new. Uh, uh, I myself have worked on a project on this in Georgia Tech almost 25 years back, where we tried to replace a lot of these uh, pipelines for a company called Ameron. We were working on trying to replace, and we offered quite a few solutions, especially for those uh, joints in terms of composites for much greater efficiency. These, I'm sure. Uh, the technologies have improved quite drastically in that quarter century and uh, it's almost used on a regular basis now. Then um, also in terms of containers, uh, you know, shipping containers, for example, um, uh, the uh, cargo that a ship carries from uh, point A to point B across countries, uh, across continents even, uh, typically is limited by their weights again, uh, just like in the case of the aerospace applications. No, probably not as stringent, but still the weight makes a huge role in terms of the performance of these ships and the container weights uh, or, or containers which have all the cargo within them uh, makes a huge difference as well. So uh, move from metallic containers to composite containers has long been uh, pursued as well uh, for uh, greater efficiency. Mm, piping I already mentioned. And uh, then sporting goods, we already talked about it quite a bit, uh, like tennis rackets, golf clubs, uh, cycles, etc. Uh, and uh, many of these uh, were actually uh, the ones, w the sporting goods were the ones which uh, actually helped um, you know, greater public visibility because some of the uh, top sportsmen uh, in some of the major competitions in the 70s and 80s used um, equipment which were made out of these uh, materials and uh, some of them won and therefore it became uh, a much uh, uh, unintended publicity for these uh, materials as well, yes. Yeah. How do you realize the joints? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so these are typically uh, sealant kind of joints. But um, there is a certain structure which is involved, uh, which is essentially uh, taking into account what is the kind of pressures at which the flow in happens within, the kind of temperatures that are involved, and how it changes over the entire year. And then you want to make sure that the joint allows for that uh, movement. Okay? So it's typically a certain kind of a mechanical uh, linkage that is there, which is sealed appropriately. and it a certain level of uh, detection and temperatures that are involved at that cu currently at that point of time. Yeah, so then, uh, af apart from uh, sporting goods, um, a lot of avionics have used that. Yeah. Yeah, um, a good question. See, uh, a lot of uh, emphasis has been, uh, as we have evolved, to moving towards adhesive kind of joints. Uh, either you co-cure if possible, or if it's not possible, you have to have a joint, you try to have adhesives. But the acceptability of the adhesive joint, especially from the certifying agencies, has been a bit slow. So you are uh, mo most of the manufacturers are looking at having these uh, riveted and or bolted joints in addition to the uh, adhesive joints as a um, backup kind of a thing. But the problem is that, uh, especially when you have a polymer matrix composite, because of its low ductility that is involved, when you want to have rivets and or bolts, you want to drill holes. The drilling typically in a metal happens with uh, the heating that happens during the drilling process. And there is a certain amount of plasticity that is induced uh, uh, at the point where you're drilling. And that advantage is not there with polymer matrix composites. So there can be a certain damage which occurs not only close to the place where you're drilling the holes, 
but also uh, a little away from it, which may not be visible unless and in, until you have uh, very stringent uh, NDT processes to look through and find out, determine if the, those issues are there. So uh, that's always been a challenge. Uh, but once again, in terms of how you actually go about doing that drilling, etc., um, you know, we used to have a colleague over here. Uh, she has unfortunately left uh, to a different institution now, but uh, she used to work a lot on uh, enhancing those drilling processes and uh, making sure that the damages that occur out of it uh, are uh, minimized. Um, again, there's a lot that we have learned very interestingly from carpentry, because carpentry, the way the grains run in the wood and how you want to uh, actually uh, machine the wood to into different shapes uh, through various processes, cutting processes that are involved. Um, uh, many of those we are learning in for composites in terms of how to align that drill bit along with the uh, direction of the fibers, how to change it as it goes past uh, lamina to different uh, layers of the same laminate, etc. So there are certain uh, things, processes that are being worked uh, in conjunction with that, but uh, as you rightly guessed, the, it is it is a challenging uh, uh, thing. And uh, what you are asking probably more is in terms of the actual joints which allow for motion, like for example, certain elastomeric joints, etc. As in the case of the helicopter uh, uh, thing, there uh, there's a lot of um, uh, uh, progress that has happened over a long period of time. Uh, primarily because we are using the material damping. Uh, that the polymer offers and therefore by introducing matrix rich regions where the uh, fiber volume fractions are much lower compared to the matrix or there's no fiber at all you're trying to make sure that the uh, the uh, drop of plies you start with the n number of plies then you go to n minus 1 n minus 2 n minus 3 etc and the ray, uh, at what distance you make the drops and how you make the drops, which of the ply drops, is it the top or bottommost ply or some intermediate ply, and how the matrix rich regions are incorporated at those locations where the plies drop. All these are, again, a lot of research has gone through and uh, success, uh, been successful in terms of coming up with designs which can do this, which is why almost on a routine basis you see helicopters uh, replacing these hinges and bearings with uh, the kind of uh, ply drop designs uh, that they have. Um, still, a lot of these companies keep uh, their own uh, ways of approaching it uh, proprietary, but uh, there's a lot of open uh, literature also uh, through uh, some of these society uh, conferences that you have. Uh, there used to be a uh, the society called the American Helicopter Society, which is now called as the Vertical Flight Society because of its more international nature. That has been around for uh, more than 50 years now, uh, uh, conducting conferences uh, annually. And uh, some of these um, papers uh, that are published in these conferences and their own journals as well are uh, uh, huge resources for aerospace designers in terms of understanding the uh, processes involved with these joint designs as well for composites. Yes, yes, yeah. Yes, yes. So you have to make sure you ta take uh, care of that. Uh, but typically what happens is when you have hybrid composites, it's only the fiber which is changed. The matrix remains the same. And the adhesive also involves a similar chemistry. The resin is very similar to the matrix that is involved. And therefore, usually there is no issue. But where the matrix also is different in the uh, two elements of the hybrid that you're bringing, two or more elements of the hybrid that you're bringing in together, um, you have to obviously inspect all the uh, compatibility issues, both physical and uh, especially chemical, uh, to ensure that uh, the compatibility is there. It's very similar to the fiber matrix compatibility that you want to bring about. Uh, the matrix to matrix or the matrix to adhesive compatibility also has to be uh, ensured. not necessary. See, typically the manufacturer will give you 
uh, all the properties of the uh, mattresses or resins that they sell. And uh, in one of those, uh, one of that, uh, in that information sheet, one of the things that will be there is which fibers are compatible with it. You know, how is the curing process to be done with, uh, with different uh, mattresses, etc. Uh, what kind of adhesives can be used along with it, etc. So that kind of uh, already gives you a shortlisted set which they have uh, undertaken rigorous testing with. So as long as you stick to that uh, subset of uh, mattresses uh, that you want to use with it or the uh, resins and adhesives that you want to use with it, you are usually uh, quite safe. Um, uh, it's, it's only when you have very, very stringent uh, kind of loading uh, cases, thermomechanical loading cases, or the hygral, hygrothermal stresses are also involved where moisture seepage, etc., comes in. There you have to obviously do your own testing for specimens uh, which uh, are exposed to those kinds of environmental and loading conditions that uh, you expect your component to experience in its service life. So then, uh, yeah, el electronics is an application where a lot of composites have been used, uh, especially these PCB boards, uh, uh, the printed circuit boards that you have, uh, you usually have uh, made out of plastics, but for greater strength and stiffness, uh, there has been uh, fiber reinforcements or, and or particle in, uh, reinforcements in many uh, situations. Then you also you want to tailor the, you could use the uh, toes itself as some kind of um, pathways for the flow of the uh, current. Uh, typically, when you have, let's say, carbon, etc., where you have greater control in terms of how you would like this to move. So you can avoid a lot of these uh, welding and other things, soldering uh, that you do with a lot of uh, uh, typical PCBs. Um, many of that, uh, the junctions can be formed in a much more uh, easier way with uh, fibers through the certain weaving technologies, etc. So those are all, again, um, niche areas of applications where the structural strength and stiffness are not of that much consequence, but more the other uh, multiple functionalities that you're bringing into the overall design. Uh, again, the same thing uh, translates to electrical appliances as well. Uh, main thing is, of course, the light, light weighting that is there. Now, mm, almost all the applications um, in non-aerospace have been for uh, for composites with symmetric uh, kind of layups. By symmetric layup, what we mean is that uh, if you have a laminate and you uh, identify its mid plane, then uh, at any distance z you go up, whatever the angle theta might be there, if you go uh, from the mid plane downwards to the same uh, uh, distance, that is, let's say, coordinate of minus z, then you will find the same uh, theta angle over there. So uh, this is essentially what we call as symmetry. Now, the symmetry uh, helps with the uh, design and especially the modeling process simplifications. And also certain uh, unwanted couplings can be uh, removed. For example, the coupling between the uh, bending and torsion on the one hand and uh, the extension and shear on the other hand. This can typically be uh, 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 given up just by a uh, design which is symmetric, irrespective of which fiber you use, which matrix you use, uh, whether it is hybrid or not, um, and what volume fractions you use, you can avoid certain uh, couplings. But um, over time, people have seen that uh, one of the main advantages of going for composites is to see if some of these couplings uh, can actually be utilized in a proper way. So you are actually, uh, by uh, restricting yourself to only symmetric laminate designs, you are um, uh, giving up on a whole lot of advantages uh, that come with it. And um, again, uh, uh, the industry, even the aerospace industry, has been conservative in terms of uh, accepting any uh, uh, layups which are uh, not symmetric or unsymmetric layups. But uh, again, helicopters, for example, have used anti-symmetric layups, laminates for a very long period of time in their primary loading, uh, load-bearing structure, namely the helicopter rotor blade flex beam. Uh, uh, the flex beam is uh, like a skeletal structure within the airfoil configuration that you have for the uh, rotor blade, which takes the main uh, structural load. And uh, in many such cases, you have already uh, uh, anti-symmetric layup. Anti-symmetric is exactly opposite of symmetric, that is, at if uh, at a 
z from the mid plane if you have an angle theta at a distance minus z you have an angle minus theta so this this is essentially your anti symmetric very similar to your matrix uh, square matrix you know how you define a symmetric matrix anti symmetric matrix very similar to that but just is in terms of with a distance from the mid plane upwards or downwards you are having that and um, the reason why uh, this has been quite successful with uh, helicopter rotor blades in particular is that already they were uh, just like in the uh, fixed wing aircraft you have what is known as a wash out or a wash in similar kind of um, uh, advantage is there in the helicopter rotor blade also in terms of having its angle of attack changed and even more so over here because it's uh, unlike in a fixed wing where the a a a at any given span Uh, if you have the y coordinate from minus b to plus b uh, the entire thing is facing the same speed at least in cruise for example so on the other hand uh, unless certain maneuvers are being done whereas in the case of the helicopter rotor blade or almost on a continuous basis different locations along the span are facing different velocities even though the helicopter might be cruising because uh, there is also the uh, velocity because of the rotation that is involved so you obviously want to have uh, where there is a higher speed and lower speed you want to be able to control the uh, the angles of attack at each location and therefore you uh, bring in a certain level of pre twist Uh, a priori, so that um, you avoid stall or wherever stall is occurring, you are minimizing that stalling region to the extent possible. You could also have, uh, in terms of tapering, uh, the way you change the airfoil cross section itself. But more often than not, it is achieved uh, quite easily through just a pre-twist itself. In addition to the mechanical pre-twist that you have. the composite design with the plus minus theta the anti symmetric layer brings in a kind of a geometric twist through the material itself so uh, it's an addition to the pre twist that is there which is in in a mechanical sense in terms of the manufacture of the flex beam how you uh, shape it but uh, the very fact that it could have a plus minus theta kind of a possibility uh, when i say theta of course it's theta at z is a function so Uh, you could have many different angles so for example you could have uh, 30 uh, 45 60 on the top and minus 30 minus 45 minus 60 at the bottom so the angles could change just that hmm, at any given z and minus z you have exactly opposite angles uh, in terms of plus and minus algebraic sign changes so uh, the uh, primary advantage of this is that it exhibits a certain uh, coupling between the extensional load and the uh, twist that is generated and extensional load is anyway there because of the centrifugal force uh, that is uh, because the helicopter rotor blade is rotating now uh, you want to utilize that to offer a certain level of twist and because it's like almost uh, without the bearing now it's a bearingless rotor so it's actually like a cantilever which is subjected to a certain uh, uh, distribution of torque or a distribution of axial load that is coming both because depending upon the aerodynamic center center of twist there could be a certain uh, torsion also coming but primarily it is the extensional uh, tensile load and that tensile load is also changing as you come because how much of the blade is trying to pull apart is different at different locations so closer to the root there is much more axial load co compared to a location which is closer to the tip now you want to take advantage of all of that using this to make sure that the extension twist that is for a given level of extension coming from the centrifugal force what is the twist that it generates the main effect of an extensional load is to increase the length which is uh, uh, of course the direct effect of it is an extensional strain but there is also a certain torsion that is coming up because of this kind of a design one is uh, because of the mechanical pre twist the second is because of this anti symmetric kind of a layer and so that extension twist coupling uh, can actually be uh, utilized um, in many many different situations and uh, a lot of things that has been learnt in helicopters also from originally from aircraft engine propellers uh, especially you have the 
uh, uh, in the initial stages, most of the designs were uh, propeller-based aircraft, either piston prop or you have the turboprop uh, kind of designs. There you see an even larger amount of twist is there in the blades compared to even the helicopter uh, rotors. Uh, so there has been a lot of learning from that. And then um, when you go to short takeoff and uh, vertical takeoff and landing uh, kind of configurations, um, especially the uh, historically successful Bell V-22 Osprey, uh, and after that a few other uh, examples of that, um, the tilt rotors, you have different configurations depending upon whether it is climbing, in which case it goes into the helicopter kind of a mode, then you tilt the rotor when once it has reached the cruise altitude so that now in forward flight you are having it uh, operating uh, very similar to an aircraft propeller. So it's uh, both a helicopter rotor as well as an aircraft propeller and some of the requirements for each of these are quite different from both the aerodynamic uh, perspective and also the kind of uh, propulsive uh, uh, requirements that are there. Uh, and again, whether it is climbing or whether it is just hovering, uh, depending on all those requirements, you have to re redesign that. And um, by appropriately having both a combination of these uh, mechanical pre twist and the uh, design of that anti symmetric layup, uh, you can make sure that uh, you are clo operating close to the optimal. Uh, in both those configurations, both as a forward uh, propulsion as well as a vertical propulsion, uh, you are trying to uh, ensure the uh, utility. Helicopter flex beams I've already talked to you about. Uh, so, of course, this is the uh, example of a tilt rotor where you are seeing that it is somewhere in between from the forward uh, motion to the uh, vertical motion. It's essentially tilting that whole thing. So uh, there are many co ways in which this tilting could be achieved. It could be a mechanism that is involved where it, the entire wing itself tilts, or there is just that rotor alone which tilts. Uh, so uh, again, that's beyond the scope of uh, flight vehicle structures. Where you can, s those of you who are interested, can uh, look at the literature involved with that. Now uh, this is an example of the uh, Dhruv, the advanced light helicopter, where. Uh, uh, a hybrid kind of a design, you are talking about the hybrid composite. So this is a classic example where uh, hybrid composites have been used in uh, Indian aerospace industry uh, for a very long period of time, almost uh, more than 20 years, uh, 20, 25 years that they have used uh, this particular configuration where they have used uh, carbon epoxy which is closer over here and then there is uh, the glass epoxy sleeve uh, around that and um, once again uh, the matrix is the same, the epoxy matrix in the glass uh, fiber re with the glass reinforcement as well as the carbon reinforcement is the same, so the uh, compatibility between them is quite good. The reason why you need uh, carbon over here is uh, closer to the hub, you have uh, larger uh, stresses coming and therefore you want more strength and stiffness over there, uh, which uh, the glass by itself is not capable of and you bring in the carbon fiber to uh, uh, be able to do that. Then. Uh, this is in the same uh, situation where how you drop the plies uh, to create a pseudo kind of a hinge. I've been talking about it. So you have a n number of plies. So each of these, I, I'm not sure if you're able to see uh, the end of the class, uh, you're uh, having so many layers over here. Each layer is essentially uh, a fiber that is there and uh, or a, it could be a unidirectional fiber. In some cases, it could be a fabric. Uh, so those uh, fibers, you see the number of layers over here is much larger than what you have over here, but it's not all dropped simultaneously. There, there are certain layers at the closer to the center which are getting dropped over here. For example, here one layer is ending here, another layer is ending, etc. So that as you go closer, you gradually dropping the number of flies and essentially creating this pseudo hinge that I've been talking about, where the in a hinge you know that the bending stiffness has to be zero, whereas here it is not zero, but it is much lesser than the bending stiffness that you have over here. So essentially it is a lower stiffness which is approaching towards zero and therefore it creates a hinge-like effect. Uh, but of course there are stresses involved because of the fact that it is not a, uh, an, an ideal hinge. And uh, the colors that you see, uh, of course, the the, uh, the golden yellow color that you have over here is the glass fiber, and the black color that you see over there is the carbon fiber in the same matrix. 
Okay, so this is uh, again uh, the same uh, example. You are looking at how the uh, hub design typically is, or close to the hub. It's the hub actually comes over here. So this is how the uh, flex beam uh, is attached to the hub over here, and uh, those uh, joints. And so uh, you cannot avoid some of these uh, bolted joints, etc. So you have to drill holes for that. That's where. Some of those uh, technologies uh, really come in handy. Um, you know, probably at that stage, they didn't have uh, much control over it. Sometimes uh, if the hole was even uh, drilled, let's say, about a millimeter away from where it was supposed to be, the entire piece has to be rejected. You cannot uh, use it anymore. So uh, that is the level of stringency that was involved. So uh, un uh, until the, all these processes became quite uh, well established, there were quite a few issues in terms of the additional costs incurred because of such wastage. Exactly. Right. 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 You can. You can do that. So, because you have wet prepregs, so and you have in this case, let's say, unidirectional fibers, you can have the fibers running around that. So, yes. So, so those are all again um, you know, uh, more kinds of fabrication techniques which have come through uh, these days. There are lots of uh, situations where you can actually do that. Uh, that's very helpful also in terms of any new stress concentration which comes through the service life wired because of the loading fatigue that is involved. Any crack that is there, the fact that a fiber is going around means that the bridging strength is much better than uh, uh, fibers which are cut across uh, the hole. Yeah, it's a good point you brought up. So then... Uh, yeah, so typically uh, there's also a lot of move towards what we did for them because uh, at that stage, uh, almost uh, 20 years back, more than 20 years back, they had some, uh, one of the prototypes of the Dhru uh, crashed and it was fatal, the pilot died. And at that uh, stage, HAL approached our lab to see if um, we can have a health monitoring system which is real time. And uh, we came up with a certain solution which was eventually employed on the uh, Dhru. So this is uh, some work towards that. So where we use uh, what I talked to you about in the very first class, one of the uh, main things that our lab does is multifunctional composites where we uh, have the composite not only as load bearing but bringing in some additional functionality. Here uh, there are certain fibers made out of a piezoelectric material called lead zirconate titanate uh, in an epoxy matrix. So it's also a composite, not as strong and or stiff as your e-glass or uh, the carbon epoxy, but uh, it offers an additional functionality of uh, co-located sensing and actuation, which was uh, eventually used over here. The advantage of using it in a fiber form was that we could put it in at plus or minus 45 degrees so that we could measure the twist very accurately. And uh, we could control it through the electric signals that we were uh, uh, sending across it because it's a co-located sensor and actuator. So it's not only uh, has a health monitoring system, but also in st to some extent uh, before the uh, pilot is able to land the aircraft, some way of uh, controlling that so that uh, the damage uh, growth is not too much. So, so these are all uh, cut, uh, very interesting cutting edge research areas uh, where you can get not only good number of publications, but also the kick of these things actually being utilized on a flying helicopter and uh, hopefully saving certain lives and uh, or uh, cost for the uh, users. So with that, uh, we come to the end of uh, some examples, some random examples uh, of uh, the way in which uh, composites can be used in various components in terms of uh, not only the materials, but also the layup kind of configurations, symmetric, anti-symmetric. There are many other types of uh, layups as well. We'll come across a few uh, as we go with the modeling aspects. But this is something that we will focus a lot of uh, time on th in terms of the course, uh, in terms of how we model flight vehicle structures, uh, irrespective of whether they are made out of metals and or composites, uh, because we'll set up a single platform for all of that. And uh, from there, we will see what are the differences uh, when we want to go for a metals metallic structure. Um, 
as it is, it will be uh, directly usable for the composite. And uh, when we want to use it for the metal, it will be kind of simplified, especially if it is uh, within the uh, yield in terms of the stress uh, distribution throughout. But if it's beyond yield, there are certain uh, complications which set in for the metallic parts. But um, since we are also, also able to uh, uh, handle metal matrix composites, so there, again, the same issues with metals like plasticity, et cetera, come into picture. So there are ways of handling it in the same paradigm. So this is the traditional approach uh, to modeling, where we typically divide it into three parts, uh, depending on the length scales that are involved. Uh, the length scales at lower le lowermost length scales is what we call as the micro mechanics and the um, uh, structural component level we call as the macro mechanics. So this is of the order of a few microns, uh, at the most of the order of a few millimeters, whereas here we are talking of the order of a few meters. And there, there is an interface between these two, which uh, we call as meso mechanics. So there's micro mechanics uh, and macro mechanics. And uh, the thing which bridges these two is your meso mechanics, which is at each uh, fly level, each layer level, because this is a laminate that we are talking about. This is um, an example that is shown over here is neither symmetric nor anti-symmetric, because you see uh, if they're all uh, assumed to be of the same uh, thickness each layer, then the mid plane will be between this plus 45 and zero. Then you see if you go to any uh, z above and below, it's neither uh, positive or negative of the other. So therefore, this is a classic example of uh, an unsymmetric uh, laminate. But uh, if you take one layer over there, let's say the plus 45 layer over here, then you know the fibers are all running in a particular direction. So which direction the stresses come uh, in each one of those layers. And oh, depending upon the overall load that is applied on the laminate, how it is getting divided between the layers, etc. All this we should be able to predict using the macro mechanic analysis. But what the micro mechanic analysis does is to make this macro mechanic analysis much more efficient. Because if we don't do this, then we will have to uh, deal with this with its individual fibers and the matrix, which is much, much more complicated because you're dealing with a structure which is of the order of a few meters. And then um, the heterogeneity is coming at a length scale, which is of the order of a few microns. So the number of elements that you would need to use, for example, if you are using a finite element analysis, you have to obviously use different materials for the fiber, uh, where there is the fiber and where there is the matrix. So it becomes almost impossible to handle even with the best of the computer uh, technologies that you may have access to. So uh, a much more intelligent way of approaching the whole problem is not to deal with the material as it is, uh, there is a level of homogenization that is being done. One is a homogenization across the layers. So instead of treating it as individual layers, all of these, if there was a single layer of a fictitious composite, how will it behave? So that uh, properties of that we want to derive. And that learning has happened already in terms of in individual layer also. We do not want to deal with the fiber and the matrix separately, unless it's for a, some special case where we are trying to look at a very small region where we want to know how the fiber is getting uh, debonded from the matrix or how a fiber is getting broken uh, or it's getting buckled because of a compressive strength in this direction or a matrix crack is happening. Some of these things we want to uh, learn, then we have to go for the actual uh, distribution of the fiber and the matrix. But very rare cases, we need to do that for the overall design. We are dealing with a healthy composite, and we don't need to worry about all those damages as long as your loads are within a certain limit and your design has taken care of those loads with appropriate factors of safety. In which case, not only in this, you have an uh, equivalent uh, layer, single layer, which takes care of all these multiple layers. Here, only four are shown. Typically, you could have 80, 100, or even more number of layers. It becomes almost uh, unimaginable uh, size of a computer problem for a, such a small component. Imagine for the whole aircraft. So you will have major issues. So you want an equivalent for this. Now, for each layer also, there is an equivalent that is uh, being done. And that is what uh, is the output of this micro mechanics, where you know there are certain fibers. You know there is a matrix sleeve around that. Um, and so if you can segregate it into something like this, each of these is called as a unit cell. 
and this unit cell and a certain number of unit cells in both directions uh, you take in order to uh, get what is known as a representative volume element. Unfortunately, even in the literature, you, you see these two uh, terms being interchangeably used, unit cell and uh, representative volume elements. They are not necessarily the same unless you have a very, very simplified model, uh, in which case um, just one cell can be a representative volume element. In, in general, you need a certain number of cells in both the directions. Certain convergence has to be achieved for uh, this to happen. Because uh, however uh, good your manufacturing technology might be, there will be certain amount of scatter in terms of how the geometries of each one of these uh, fibers are in terms of the cross section. You uh, typically want to have it circular. That is the uh, ideal. And that is, uh, these are exaggerated. You don't see uh, in many conventional cases uh, elliptic, unless, of course, you're cutting it the way I have shown cut over here. Because if I'm cutting this over here and looking at it, they would all be circular. But if I'm cutting it in this angle or any other angle other than the zero degrees, you will see uh, it elliptical because of uh, the uh, way in which the fiber is being cut. So it's being cut in this direction. You see that this, uh, uh, this becomes the major axis and this becomes the minor axis for that elliptical uh, kind of a configuration. But um, uh, let's say in the actual manufacture, there could be slight changes in the uh, diameter. Uh, each uh, fiber may not be of exactly same uh, dimension. There could be a very small change over that. And also where it is placed, it may not be in the center of that matric matrix in the unit cell. It, it could be positioned at different locations. So all of these variations that are there, you have to go for a non-deterministic kind of an analysis to do that. But uh, uh, from this course point of view, we will not take such a complicated situation, assuming that uh, more or less you have them placed at the center, they're all circular in nature, then a single unit cell itself becomes a, a representative volume element, and the size of the unit cell is essentially formed from the uh, volume fraction that you have for the fiber and the matrix because you know what is the cross section of the fiber uh, because um, considering the length of, of this matrix sleeve and the fiber to be the same the volume fraction is same as the area fraction so the area fraction for the fiber is same as the area fraction for the uh, uh, volume fraction for the fiber because uh, the length is the same so you can cancel out the length from the volume fraction and then you uh, ha end up with the area fractions. So the area of this uh, fiber cross section divided by the area of this matrix sleeve will give you the uh, vo fiber volume fraction, which is what you want to uh, achieve. And um, depending upon the specific configuration, there are certain theoretical maxima that you can go to in terms of uh, this, uh, in this kind of a configuration, or if it's a hexagonal kind of a configuration, or some other uh, va uh, various uh, standardized configurations that are there, you can see how you can increase it, but never can you have 100% uh, fiber volume fraction because of the uh, shape of the fibers, uh, which are assumed to be circular fibers over here. Uh, in the example that I showed you uh, uh, of, a, of a multifunctional fiber composite over in the previous slide, uh, where we had the PZT as a fiber, uh, in an epoxy matrix, there those fibers were actually uh, square cross sections. Though there, theoretically speaking, you could have 100% fiber volume fraction because the entire uh, area could be filled with that. But of course, uh, uh, you have all the disadvantages of using the fiber alone, which we have discussed quite a bit in terms of uh, the reason why we are using the matrix uh, over there. So there is a certain limit from a theoretical point of view, and usually you don't even use that upper limit from the theoretical point of view. You use it slightly lower because you want to uh, bring in some of the matrix functionalities uh, into uh, play uh, in the overall composite. So now what is this um, micro mechanics doing? It is taking those uh, fiber properties, it is taking the matrix properties, it is taking their volume fractions. Here of course we have assumed there are no other additives, that's uh, only these two materials are there. And also we are assuming that there are no voids. So if it is uh, manufactured uh, using some of the current state of the art, uh, the void uh, percentage would be minimal. And therefore, you do not have air pockets coming in anywhere so that the 
fiber volume fraction plus the matrix volume fraction equal to one. So if you know one of them, the other can be obtained by subtracting it from one. So uh, just you know the volume fraction, you know the properties, uh, the relevant properties of both of those materials, then you can arrive at a fictitious unit cell, which is uh, made up of a ma fictitious material, which is having certain anisotropic properties, that is properties different in different directions, which, is, which are in turn functions of the properties of the fiber, properties of the matrix, and their volume fractions, uh, so that now instead of using uh, fiber and matrix separately, I can use that equivalent homogenized material. So, yes, I am uh, introducing an isotropy, even if the K, if the matrix was isotropic and let's say the fiber was also by itself isotropic, uh, you would still uh, bring in an anisotropy by going into an uh, into the equivalent homogenized model. But the advantage is that instead of a heterogeneous model that we had, now we have a homogeneous model. And that means that the uh, way in which I want to discretize this for a numerical uh, solution, etc., could be much larger um, uh, unit cells or elements that you want to have in the finite element modeling. And therefore, the model size can uh, come down quite drastically. So traditional modeling approach has always been uh, start from the lowest length scale and from that you go to an equivalent model and then uh, which is a single layer and those layers you put in different angles come to your uh, laminate and that laminate you put in over a particular shape let's say an eye section or uh, for a spar or a skin which is a certain curved uh, sheet that you want to have or uh, whatever that particular component might be you bring it into that overall shape and along with its joints etc come with the come up with the boundary conditions some in terms of the load some in terms of the displacements uh, or rotations that are possible and then uh, you try to solve the overall problem now this bottom up approach uh, is uh, really good from uh, preliminary design point of view and a lot of uh, analysis point of view also but when we want to do more rigorous stuff, that is, uh, you want to do a damage analysis and uh, want to ensure that the damage is postponed or you want to do an accident investigation, etc. In such situations, there is a need to go not only bottom up, but also from top down uh, kind of an approach where, yes, you have uh, got the overall uh, solution for this uh, fictitious uh, material that you want to have. But in the actual material, how is the fiber responding? How is the matrix responding? How are the interfaces responding? Uh, which are being stressed out more? Is there a way I can increase uh, their capabilities? Uh, whichever is least capable, can I increase its capability so that the overall capability of the material and the structure becomes better? So these are the kinds of things that you can do only by going backwards to the from the larger length scale back to the lower length scale in terms of a subcomponent analysis and eventually the micro mechanics with not the equivalent homogenized but the actual uh, distribution of the structure and uh, in doing these simultaneously we come up with a, another modeling paradigm what we call as the concurrent modeling approach a concurrent multi scale modeling approach where you are modeling at different length scales concurrently and you are letting information transfer both ways you are not only taking information bottom up you are also taking it top down so that you are able to handle some of the more intricate issues involved uh, with the design may not always be necessary but sometimes it is necessary this is in addition to what we already talked about over here introducing a non deterministic approach to take care of the uh, the, the variations in the uh, fiber geometry and or the uh, distributions uh, specially yes at the end of the day not on all days you do it only when it is necessary so when you are doing something like um, uh, let's say material improvements or you are doing an accident investigation which is not the day to day regular stuff that an aircraft designer typically goes through so for most parts you don't need to go back 
in that particular direction. It's only for certain decision making processes which are involved in improvement of the material level itself or uh, in terms of improving certain uh, design paradigms in terms of how you want to make the fiber placements, etc., which are not done on a day to day basis. It's done on a um, uh, class of materials or a class of uh, structural components that you want to uh, come up with refined ways of uh, approaching its design. So that's not done on a regular basis. That, that's the reason why for a regular usage you want an equivalent homogenized approach because um, this will be good enough for you because once you have done this you know the overall uh, displacements that are there, overall stresses that are developing etc. And from that you can make a decision in terms of uh, failure criteria because there are also failure criteria not just for these individual materials but you can develop failure criteria for the um, equivalent homogenized materials also what are known as for example the Sai Wu criteria, Sai Wu Han criteria essentially named after people who have contributed towards coming up with those models uh, and uh, those criteria will not require you to go back in the um, from the top down uh, approach uh, to the lower length scales. Uh, it's only from a material science point of view when you want to make an improvement or certain design uh, principles that you want to change overall that you will do and that is not very often. Yeah, see, you see, all of these modeling, one is, of course, they have to be based on the physics, and you have to ensure that the math uh, that is involved is as uh, appropriate as possible, as state of the art as possible. This, uh, the third thing is what you are mentioning in terms of the approximation of what we call as assumptions. What are the assumptions involved? Because this is no longer the actual structure, even if you are considering uh, them as separate, it is still a model. A model is not the reality. It is ha having certain assumptions built into it. Now the question is you have to explore each and every one of those assumptions one by one at each stage that they are invoked. How relevant are those assumptions and whether those assumptions are necessary at all. Um, for a long time we have been using certain assumptions which are um, not even necessary but because others have used that assumption we also continue to use that assumption. Even if we drop that assumption with the current state of the art we might be able to derive the theories. Uh, but just because somebody else made an assumption, you are making an assumption. So there are certain unnecessary assumptions like that. Then there are certain assumptions uh, which uh, may be necessary for the mathematic because it's so complicated, you may not be able to solve the problem without that. Uh, but there are numerical solutions, always you can go for that. So uh, the important point is to make sure that both the, uh, the assu every assumption that you make is both necessary as well as relevant. So for relevant for the class of problems, it might be relevant for a certain class of problems, it may not be for another class of problems, but at least you know uh, uh, to what extent your model is applicable and um, you don't stretch its application to regimes where it is not applicable. So th these are the things that you have to uh, make up for. But at the end of the day, uh, the proof of the pudding is in uh, tasting it, which means that you have to test it. So, uh, so you have to do certain tests to make sure that uh, your theoretical predictions are actually uh, respected at either at your experimental level tests in the lab uh, on specimen or in flight tests where you work backwards from certain sensor readings to see what are the stresses, strains, etc. involved and whether uh, you've uh, uh, accounted for them appropriately within the model. So there is always going to be a little bit of scatter and there's going to be a slight difference which is all what is going to be taken into account through your margins of safety, your factors of safety, etc. So you make sure that uh, those are uh, reasonable enough to be able to account for those scatters. Now, if you want to reduce those factors that are involved, you bring in all these other things that uh, into picture, like we, we discussed the uh, non-deterministic approach, the concurrent multi-scale modeling, etc. To a large extent, they will try to help you to uh, reduce those margins over a period of time. So I think uh, with this we will stop and continue the next class. Thank you.